Hey everybody, this is Dr. Lori Shemek. And I'm Omar Cumberbatch. You're listening to This Podcast Burns Fat. Hey Lori, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Omar, and everybody else uh, out there. We are just thrilled and excited about 2024. And, you know, it really is, if you if you keep your awareness uh, high about what you want in life in terms of your health, your mindset, it really does happen. And small little changes in the way you think about things, the choices you make. You know, I put something out on Twitter today about how uh, just every day, we have choices we can make to reduce inflammation in our body. We don't have to do all of them, but just one is fine, you know, and it really has a powerful effect. And so that's, I guess, my message for 2024 is to, you know, really think about what you can do and and just be consistent with it. One or two choices even. No, absolutely. That's why this is definitely my favorite holiday by far. I think mm-hmm. just because it introduces that subtle mind shift that, is necessary and then we could just kind of refocus and get our goals in order i think it's really like a good time to just do an assessment of way you know basically what we did the year prior and then what changes we want to have come forth in our lives for sure so yeah no i'm excited about 2024 i i like well, that we're starting this year off with a, a topic that we haven't explored in, in a couple of years actually and that's the topic of uh, fascia i've had great experiences with myofascial release therapy and i you know this today's guest anna ray goes into uh, it so much deeper because like we were, we're kind of going to dive into there's just so much more information that's available to us that they're learning about this thing that you know it, at one time it was just thought of as just nothing <laughs> like this thing that getting yeah. in the way of like the bigger body organs the and muscle, stuff like right, that. Yeah. right yeah and now they're finding out it is a really powerful part of our, you know, human system. Yeah, it's mind blowing what Anna brings uh, to us today. Will blow your mind in terms of the uh, the importance of it and um, how it affects every area of your life. So, yeah, I was, I was, I really loved having her on and learned so much about fascia. Yeah, no, absolutely. So let's jump into the show. Okay. Hey, Anna, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much Hi, for having me. Thank meeting. you for stopping by. So yeah, great to have you. you. And you're going to be talking to us today about fascia. And and so uh, if you could just give us a little bit about, you know, um, what fascia is and why it's important. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my <laughs> my process with fascia was... <laughs> Um, quite uh, long and extensive. And I'm going to give you my version because what's kind of fun about fascia is that it's just um, now being really scientifically studied and it's now being um, looked at more from um, a holistic perspective. And so when you hear about fascia, most people think about fascia as this kind of spider web type tissue that if you kind of take off your skin and you looked inside, it would look like a spider had gone crazy inside with this gel-like webbing and it's (laughs) scattered everywhere. Um, But fascia is kind of like a generic term, ironically, kind of like saying my shirt is made of cotton. Uh, Fascia is a um, generic term for a whole um, collective of type of connective tissues um, in the body that hold the body together and give it shape. Um, Like when you talk about fascia in your muscles and your bones, it's called myofascia. When you talk about fascia in your um, organs, it's called the viscera. When you talk about it as um, a gelatinous substance that gives you padding and works with your overall metabolic process, it's called the ECM or your extracellular matrix. And so it's this kind of like big body of connective tissue. And what's really fascinating is that this connective tissue organizes an entire body system that comes complete with its own organs. And uh, for many years, fascia, well, I'd say for the last 250 years of anatomical 
uh, discoveries, fascia has kind of been discarded in the medical community when you're dissecting cadavers. It's kind of like this superfluous stuff that's like, get it out of here so I can get to the heart. This big heart looks really impressive. Or let me get to these kidneys. These look impressive. And so um, it's now that we're like kind of looking at maybe since it's everywhere and it's around everything, maybe it has more importance than we originally thought. And so as they're starting to put things together, they start to look at it from an entire system perspective. And that's kind of interesting because the organs of fascia are not mast organs like lungs, heart, you know, kidneys, or those are glands, but um, they are more layered in and around every other body system. And so all of a sudden fascia starts to have major impl um, implications in your lymphatic system in your digestive system, in your nervous system. And so that's what really gets exciting is when you look at it from this kind of whole world or whole body view of what is fascia doing and how is it related. And for the listeners, it's probably safe to say that if you are having or interested in some part of your health, fascia is very, very much involved. The connective tissue system is kind of this unknown or un tapped source for um, information on how to peak your health and your wellness. So Anna, what, what does it actually do? I know, and it's really interesting that how prevalent it is in your body and it's in all these major sites that we obviously have interest in and we know that it affects our health. What do you think at this point the role of fascia is and how, what have they discovered about it as of, as of today? That's such a great question. So fascia is important. Um, from kind of just the material substance because it connects all of the body systems and its parts. It protects like a shock, shock absorption um, and creates glide and slide and hydration in the tissues. It organizes by organ, muscles, um, shape and body systems. It synchronizes all body electrochemical functions and body motion. It irrigates for total cellular tissue organ and system hydration. And it lubricates, reducing friction on the organs and the tissues. That's and the mechanical incredible. Stresses. I know. It literally has the most pervasive influence of all other systems is what they're starting to find. And so when you look to it as a master body system, it actually is a communication system. It forms a type of like fiber optic communication in which the brain and the body as an organ of proprioception and consciousness has more density of, of sensory receptors than any other um, tissue in the body. It's a sonic system. It responds to vibrational frequencies. It's a transportation system. It produces and moves fluids through all your cells. It's how nutrients from your food gets delivered into your cells and um, also moves hormones around your body. It's a circulat uh, circulatory system and that it actually distributes the cellular hydration and cellular, cellular nutrients. And then it's a detoxification system as part of waste and toxic removal from inside of your tissues. And lastly, it's a motion system initiating motion on all levels of your body function. So that's where we start to see movement and fascia connected, but it's more than just stretching fascia. It's actually about how fascia is animating. So in its greatest service to your body, the greatest service is that fascia is like your, or I should say the connective tissue system is your body's smart grid. It's what takes high voltage force load, like mechanical load from living and the internal like lighter frequency, low frequency of your heartbeat, which puts off an EKG. And it's constantly modulating these two high frequency, low frequency energy systems and using its movement and its electro hydraulic mechanism balances out and modulates the difference of these energies, which is sometimes when it comes into conversation about weight loss and body metabolism, because when tissue, fascial tissue is unhealthy, restricted, uh, fibrotic, ossified, um, and dehydrated, it actually can slow your whole body's energetic or metabolic processes, all of the systems that rely on fascia's, you know, fluid nature to move nutrients, um, the, the fact that here's an interesting fact. So when you eat, your esophagus starts to contract and it synchronizes with the colon to move food through efficiently into elimination as you digest. 
And when fascia motility, it's called organ motility decreases, it actually slows down your digestive process and that retards or also re, um, suppresses um, metabolic activity in the body. So there's all of these different ways, but that's that's the big level of what fascia and the connective tissue system does. Um, so what I found really interesting about what you said earlier was that it affects metabolic health mm -hmm. and how does that work? Right. Without getting too deep, I tend to mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> lose people when I go into the, you know, uh -huh. the chemistry, the biochemistry. So let's talk about it in like a, a broad sense. But so every single system in your body relies on its motion and its ability to function um, from the condition that it's sitting in. So fascia creates like this internal environment It's called the fascial microbiome. And when oh, wow. the fascial microbiome is healthy and it's hydrated and so it's when, fluid. I'm sorry to interrupt, yes, um, totally. but when you say microbiome, are you talking about the collection of bacteria? No, it's outside the gut. Okay. It's not the same thing as the internal intestinal well, we microbiome. Have a, right, but we have a microbiome. We have it on our skin. Uh, um, through the ECM and stuff. I'm not sure about that term, but, in, but as far as the microbiome that we have, I can't remember how many, I think it's seven altogether, uh, microbiomes in the body. Oh, seven. Mm -hmm. You're teaching me. I did not know <laughs> that. I know that there was internal and like, and so in fascia land, when we talk about it, we talk a lot about like intracellular and extracellular spaces mm -hmm. and what's happening in between these fluid exchanges in the cells. Um, so tell, what are the seven? Tell me of the seven. That's so fascinating. Well, there's, we have it in our, we have an oral microbiome. We have the gut microbiome. We have, uh, they're actually uh, finding out we have one in our brain. We have one in our nose and on our oh skin. God, I've heard the brain. Okay. And I can't remember... Is the other one? There was another one. Um, but suffice it to say, I think any area of the body has, That's when you say so the word microbiome, it makes me think of a collection of bacteria. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's what they're finding. It's in the very like kind of preliminary, I'm talking like, I just read, uh, they just presented in the Fascial Research Society, a paper on this, mm. that's talking about the fluid shift in fascia through mechanical loading and what that does to, you know, um, latent viruses and different bacteria inside this extracellular space that is composed of like your ECM and like interstitium and other parts of the fascial mm -hmm. collection. And so I think maybe that that's what they're talking about is that this is yet maybe another um, that might microbiome be, exactly. that is, sorry, say what? That exactly, that exactly might be that, right. Yeah, and so I think that, that what they're finding, and this was a research that was done on um, NASA astronauts actually, that they spend a lot of time outside of gravitational pull. And when they were coming back into mechanical load through, gravita uh, through gravity, the fascia with compression moves fluid and shifts, it's called a fluid shift. And it shifts a lot of the inner contents of our fascial biome, which can actually initiate latent responses in these bacterias. And so they were finding that um, it would affect their health, either you know getting them more sick or they wouldn't have had like Epstein-Barr starts to rise inside of their tissues. And so um, when we talk about like kind of the metabolic activity, um, let's, let's back up. 50%, between 45 and 50% mm -hmm. of your body mass is connective tissue part of the connective tissue system. And inside the connective tissue system almost makes up this, um, this internal environment in which your cells are reproducing in terms of where your nutrients are going. It's almost like kind of the, um, well, they call it the extracellular space that's not inside the cell. And so- Oh yeah, that, yeah, it, I know it, right, exactly. Um, and so I think that in my- understanding of it as it, as research is coming out that the um 
metabolic activity. So we think about metabolism only on kind of like the last layer of exercise and fitness and burning calories. Mm -hmm. the metabolic activity starts cellularly, how cells are being regenerated, how cells are actually producing and mechanically moving their own nutrients and waste products out. And so we look at the body metabolically as like even chemical metabolic links, like how hormones are being uh, circulated, digested, eliminated. And so we try to take a bigger picture through the fascial lens or the connective tissue lens, which is overall health relies on motion. Overall me metabolic activity relies on motion, which is kind of the capital M. So it's beyond just the movement that we do in our fitness. It starts really deep inside our cells. And what fascia is showing is that what is actually the end result of motion is the end of a metabolic process of waste and cellular debris and fluid and lymphatics moving and eliminating through the energetic grid of fascia into motion. So motion doesn't become this like something other. It is the um, accumulation of all of these movements from somatic to kinetic into cinematic space mm. that creates the um, layered effect of metabolism. Metabolism isn't just happening on one level. So if you are having a hard time with, you know, um, hormones um, distribution and levels and how things are going, fascia usually has quite a bit of influence over that based upon the state or the um, status of your connective tissue. If you're here, let me, let me go back into a simple way to picture this. If you have a sponge and it is super dry, but all of your veins and your organs lay inside this sponge, they too will be held rigid and will not be able to move inside of this, um, this system. When you start using your fascia and having the fibers individuated and hydrated, the sponge is soft and it can take water in and it can push water out and it creates this kind of like a hydraulic action that is used to synchronize the movement of the lymph that's moving through, of your veins that are moving through. And it kind of creates this, like, I wanna say this base level of metabolic activity in which all of these other systems are functioning. And so that's where you start to see the multiple layers that, for example, you can try really hard. I had this client come in and she was really dedicated. I think she was naturally built um, to be a heavier kind of like sturdy person but she was really, really dedicated to eating healthy and eating clean and eating natural and fresh. And she could not lose her weight. She could not do it. And so what we were looking at is like, where are you moving and, and what is not animating? We talk a lot about this in fascia, which is fascia has an ability not just to stretch, but to animate, which is like um, the foundation of this is a, is a hydraulic type mechanism, like a syringe where you push and pull fluid that moves through. And fascia is divided into tubes, little micro um, kind of tubulars that are around everything. That's its major structure is in a tube shape. And this syringe is a good analogy for how fascia moves by pulling and pushing energy through to be able to hydrate and get the motion of your organs and your esophagus and synchronize all of those levels that I was talking about. And so we came in and she was like, I do all these crunches. I work out four times a week and I, you know, I'm constantly not eating fat or I'm, you know, following the, sometimes it was the latest craze. She's like, I've tried to heal my microbiome in my gut and I'm taking probiotics and just, she was just overwhelmed. And I said, well, let's like back it out and be really simple. Let's go in and check your organ motility. How well are your organs actually moving? And she's like, oh, no one's ever actually talked to me about that. And I said, okay, well, let's check your diaphragm. Let's check some of these other systems that fascia is busy regulating and helping animate. And uh, the long story short is within about three weeks of doing fascial-based animated exercises, her entire torso and her gut and her belly fat had decreased by maybe three or 4% doing no additional cardio, doing no additional, um, you know, kind of diet restrictions or any, anything that was related to more of what I like to think of as like topical things that we are taught, um, that are the source of, um, being able or the solution to fascia kind of works on the back end 
and gives us this alternative way into our body systems. And it was really fascinating. A lot of it was detox. Her organs weren't eliminating well. She'd always struggled with constipation um, from doing high fiber things to try to help with her diet. And so it's just this interesting, um, I love that fascia gives us this new lens to include. It doesn't have to eclipse these other great things that we're learning and, and stuff, but it's almost like when my personal story with fascia is that I had tried everything to heal my body at 18, I felt 80 and I won't go into the like deep, deep um, dive of my story, but I had really tried everything East and West. And while nothing like, you know, not one thing was the answer, what fascia did when I really started realizing that that's what was going on, the connection between all of my various health problems, it was a relief. It was like, oh my gosh, there's another lens from which we can view whatever, health, like weight loss, um, depression, like from mental health all the way into our physical health, it gives this clear picture of how things are connected. Because I don't know if you guys have found this, and especially as a doctor, I feel like a lot of the Western ways we've been taught to um, diagnose really are about trying to narrow an aperture and trying to get really specific with diagnosis. And sometimes we can miss obvious connections to things if we constantly narrow the focus and are narrowing our specialty rather than what else can we include? And fashion kind of does mm -hmm. that. It's like, hmm, what else is on the, um, what else is connected to this? Why, mm -hmm. for me, why was my digestive? I was diagnosed with IBS. I had multiple colonoscopies. They could not find what was wrong with me. And as soon as I started freeing up restrictions in my fascia, in my low back and in my diaphragm, my, my um, diet completely regulated. My wow. elimination, like, totally regulated. In fact, I had struggled with an eating disorder when I was 18. And when I stepped off the plane after doing my first four months with fascia, my mom started crying and she's like, oh, you're sick again. I know you have an eating disorder. <laughs> and I said, no, mom, I'm actually the healthiest I've ever been. But she's like, but why are you so thin? And I said, because I've lost all my inflammation because I've lost all of the junk that was stuck in my colon. <laughs> and she's like, this is amazing. Anyway. So it's just a nice option to be able to include in your lens through which we're trying to solve, you know, health issues and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So. so with having said that, and with your experience as well, is there a way to create healthy fascia to yes. create optimal health? Yes. Thank you for asking. There are two things that fascia hates worse than anything. And then I'll tell you the one thing it wants you to do. One, it hates to be sedentary. And that is something that in our lives we're constantly faced with because we are all usually working at desks or behind computers and doing our workload from a chair, which is neither, which lacks dynamics. And I'll get into that when we talk about what fascia loves. Then the second thing fascia hates is getting up after that long day and going out and burning ourselves in a gym or a workout. It's the all or nothing. It's almost like going out after a winter of being wrapped up in your coat and sitting by the pool without any sunscreen on. Fascia literally can get burned and inflamed and um, kind of scorched by our over-aggressive methods for trying to compensate for more of our sedentary lifestyle. So what fascia loves is microdosing. It loves to have regular douses of movement we see this oftentimes in nature, in animals, it's called pandiculation. It's a reflex that when they lie down or after they chase or, or, you know, being chased by a lion, they will stretch their fascia and twitch and start creating this movement. It's almost like when a snow in a snow globe becomes sedimentary and like lays down really heavy and flat. It needs to like be taken and kind of shaken to create energy surgence through the system of the tissues. And that's how the fibers become hydrated and start that animating process. So when people are wanting to take care of their fascia, um, you want to start thinking about dynamic, the dynamics of movement. And I kind of like um, touched on this a little bit ago about this syringe, but every biomechanical movement in the body is based upon two actions. 
And first you have to see the human body as a bunch of tubes, not sticks. Okay. So we always think about old classic biomechanics of like levers and pulleys. Our bones are sticks and then they kind of like pull our muscles and we work much in a solid uh, body model, but fascia is 70% water and it is held into those structures of tubes that I was talking about. And so all of a sudden we need to start creating movement that compresses and tractions. Those are the two foundational movements. Think for the, for the listener, think of like an accordion where you push and you pull. And this kind of motion is what moves fluid through and starts to hydrate and individuate the fibers of your fascia. Cause we don't want fascia to be like hair that has too much hair gel in it, where it gets sticky and locked in. Another good anal analogy for people to think of is that most people from our modern day lifestyles has fascia that's kind of like ramen noodles. They're very rough, hard, stuck together and brittle. And what we really need is some nice warm water to individuate and to start separating and to start hydrating our tissues so that everything that sits inside of this tissue can start to move better. So when you look at your movements, all of the time we're always taught to like hold a solid core, tighten your abs, but then that locks up the tube of your torso in which all of the fascia is trying to move energy through. When we try to over tighten and tone our muscles and we focus on stability rather than mobility or agility, we start to lock down the system that's responsible for creating um, our health and vitality. So what I tell people is that we look at movement and everything in the body is either a flexion or an extension, a compression or a traction. And so one thing that your listeners can think about is looking around micro movements, right? Where can I do this throughout my day? And the first thing I tell people, because it's the opposite of sitting and sedimentary lifestyle is to first add traction. Traction is the pulling of your body apart. If you hang from your uh, a pull-up bar, you're tractioning your body. You can do this with your feet on the ground by hanging on to your kitchen sink or a sink at your office and putting hanging your feet actually on. feels good too. It's so good for you. And, and this is one of my greatest things is that when you start taking care of fascia, it's about how it feels. It feels nutritious. It feels right. You know, when you start to change your taste from like sugar cravings to actually like craving healthy things. Mm -hmm. There's this change in the body that when you start moving for fascia, it changes your taste yeah. for movement. And that's really good news for people who don't really like to exercise because <laughs> you'll have the inspiration that's not from, you know, willpower. It's because your body's going to be like, oh my gosh, this feels so good. And so we want attraction first. We want to pull our tissues and try to like get them as long as possible because fascia is different than muscles. Muscles strengthen by tightening and shortening. Fascia strengthens by pulling long. And if you think about a Chinese finger toy, when you're playing with a kid, it's like those kind of woven fi um, fiber things that you stick your fingers in at the ends. When you pull back on your fingers, they it locks against that fiber. And that's how fascia works is that it, when you add traction, it creates this nice stability, but with length. And that is um, what helps to create agility and mobility too, as you start to move. So wow. that's what I tell people is that the first thing you need to do is decompress your body by adding traction mm -hmm. and fascia will start to actually kind of restore its own, it's called elasticity or rebound and recoil, which it uses to move energy efficiently through your body. So I, I love what you're saying. And I, I guess one of the things being that this is so new and unfamiliar to m many people, I, 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 I had an off air conversation with you a couple of weeks back yeah. and I, I think this is phenomenal. I, I do, I have used it myself. I, I can definitely vouch for it in a number of ways that I could describe at a later time. But what I'm curious too, is like, you definitely put into the movement uh, aspect of it. What about diet and like, maybe nutrition or supplementation that helps with our fascia. I keep hearing this idea of basically um, giving it enough. I, I, I want to say uh, water. <laughs> I would think yes, that might have hydration. a uh, hydration. I've heard component. That. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm just curious if you have anything uh, around yeah. that as well. So one good, good question. So fascia is primarily a protein, right? And it is, um, it's got collagen and elastin and, uh, you know, a few other materials. And so it really does need 
protein, but protein can actually zap some of the hydration in the body. If you over, you know, like go into ketosis and stuff, which is often common when people are trying to burn fat. And so the first thing that you want to try to do is actually eat your water rather than drinking it because there's different ways that the body metabolizes or distributes water. Some are like, you know, um, flood fields, some are like irrigation and slow drip. And so you want to meet all of the body's hydration needs that comes less from the water you drink and more from the food that you eat. And so one of the, um, there's actually a really good book on this. If you um, are interested, it's called Quench. And it's talking about kind of this new um, yes. science of optimum. We hydration. had her on our show. Oh, did you? She's yes. fabulous. Yeah. I love what she has to say. It was a while ago though, but yeah, it was oh, great. Did you? Yeah. Oh, she's fabulous. And so anyway, I love it. And she also has a great chapter on some of the basics of fascia, which was really um, exciting from the hydration perspective. And so um, for readers, it's just selecting foods that are really high in water content and also not eliminating fiber from the um, water sources that we have, because that tends to make it more slow drip and it has an easier chance of getting into your cellular structures. So um, adding things like chia seeds, adding things like um, vitamin C is also really good for fascia, but that's on a another nutritional level, um, not different, but just a different conversation than just the hydration. Um, one of the things that she says, which I think is really good for tissue, which I adopted is being able to eat, um, like a piece of fruit after you choose to have a piece of pizza in the idea that is not eliminating and isolating things, but kind of integrating. If I'm going to eat something that requires water to digest, like, you know, high refined carbohydrates, put something back in that matches the same extraction of hydration from the tissues. Um, I think another thing is good, healthy fats and oils, um, because we have grown to be really fearful and kind of like uh, fat phobic. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think that that is essential to being able to keep hydration in the tissues and slow down. Cause you can actually, obviously with, um, I don't know how much you guys go into this, but you know, um, destabilizing the electrolyte balance in the body by overhydrating if you just drink water. Mm -hmm. And so being able to, um, find ways and find the methods to slow down that doesn't strip where water isn't stripping. It's kind of the same thing when you have a flash flood, just drinking a huge gallon of, of water is very destabilizing to the body. Um, and so I think the other, um, only other thing is that fascia is really kind of this alkaline environment, everything in the body and water as I've been reading it, and you guys can correct me on this, but that, you know, the, there's a myth. It's actually a myth that water pH balanced water really greatly affects the pH of your tissues in the body. And most of that comes from actually balancing, um, the acidic levels of what you eat. And right. also there's this thing called, um, glycation, which is where we consume too much sugar from that, which is being able to metabolize outside of the tissues. Um, and that also will lead to inflammation and inflammation naturally dehydrates, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It creates a much more acidic and environment. And vice versa. Yeah. 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 Um, I have a question yeah. and um, before we wrap, I would like to know what are your thoughts if you have them on the vibration plate and fascia? If you know oh, anything about, yeah, I love the vibration plates. I think oh, they're great. Very good. Okay. Fascia has like about five primary mechanical receptors that all respond to different stimuli. And so it's a farce to think that you can just simply roll on your fascia and get all of the fascial benefits. Fascia. Oh, needs... I'm glad you just, you answered that. It was one of my questions. I forgot. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think that people are starting, right? So the way that fascia has always been approached is through movement or stretching or mm -hmm. manual therapy. And um, we think about fascia still primarily from being able to influence it from um, kind of changing our muscular skeletal fascia, which is a start. It's, it's really important, but that it goes way obviously beyond that, like we were talking. So I love these fascial plates because, uh, or vibration plates, because they, 
um, stimulate like the Goji receptor and the Ruffini receptors. And it gives you a bunch of different types of stimuli, which makes actually the greatest benefit to that is that it helps when fascia is remodeling, it will stimulate good remodeling habits. So fascia in order to remodel about every seven months, I think it's something like, I might be a little off on this, but uh, every seven months, 50 to 60% of your fascia is renewed. It's a very high turning over, almost kind of like your your liver yeah. um, tissue because um, it's constantly restructuring to meet the de demands and the loads of your body and the stresses of your body. And so as, uh, but not everything stimulates a fibroblast, it's called fibroblasts, um, that are producing the material of fascia um, to, re, uh, to remodel. And so it's very important to give different stimuli stimulization to be able to excite and um, ignite the fibroblast response in cellular remodeling. Is this wow. way that is wonderfully said. And you have been just incredible in your breadth of knowledge and helping oh, so many you. of us. So yeah, it's just, so my takeaway from you is pretty much if you keep your fascia healthy, yes. um, you're, you're pretty much going to have, uh, every aspect of health touched. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you get your fascia in peak optimized condition, almost every other system functions better. I would say not almost every single function. And so that's why like I call, I, I, what I teach is called GST and it's called holistic body care because when you use motion to do what acupuncturist chiropractors, I don't really, I sometimes go to this on podcasts, but think about it this way, that every person that you go to, to take care of your body only has three tools. Okay. They're tapping into different systems, but they're all taking only three tools. You have a lever, which is like a, a long um, stick. Then you have a um, force, which applies tension or mechanical load to get flow. A chiropractor takes your bones, puts them in a shape, applies pressure to get movement in your joints. A massage therapist uses their arms and legs and elbows to push into your muscles to get your muscles to release. Even acupuncturists take the small lever of a needle, they stick it into a meridian to get your chi to flow. And when you start looking at a whole body care through fascia, fascia needs to animate and needs to flow, have the ability to push energy and nutrients all around your body. You have all of those tools. You have a skeletal system. You can apply it and make different shapes in your body, which we consider like an exercise, like, you know, a position in exercise. And then how you push force through your body to get flow is the idea of holistic body care. So your motion can literally support and or supplant all of your therapies if you do it right. And that's what fascia wants. Fascia wants you to use your motion to manipulate its consistency to be able to create healthy environment inside of your body. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So, Anna, just give us your information so that our audience can definitely keep up with all the great stuff that you're doing, you know, your website, your social media handles, anything that we can keep up with fascia and all the new stuff that we're just uncovering on a daily basis. So that'd be yeah. awesome if you could supply us no with that. Thank you. Yeah. I would say come to Anna Ray, A-N-N-A-R-A-H-E. That's Anna Ray.com. It's spelled weird, Rahi, if you have to remember it phonetically. Mm -hmm. And that's a great landing place. If you, you know, sign up for my newsletter, you'll get 10% off of either. We have a, we have a studio, online studio where you use motion um, as your exercise and as your um, body care. And we also have tools, um, body care tools that have been designed specifically to this task. And um, you can follow me at GST body um, at, on Instagram and an array of GST. So uh, you put those in the notes, right? Cause that's a lot of information. Oh, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So look for the thing. Cause that's a lot to remember. Honestly, <laughs> <really>. <laughs> Anna, um, thank you so much. Oh my uh, gosh, I'm so grateful. We to truly you appreciate you. And uh, I learned a lot today. Oh my yeah, gosh, likewise. thanks for having me. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pleasure. All right. Have a great rest of the day. Take care and thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of This Podcast Burns Fat. We're so excited to have you as a listener, and we're hoping that you really enjoyed the content as well. And if you did, please run over to iTunes and provide a rating and or review. It will go a long way in helping us continuously build our listenership up so that we could provide you with the excellent content regarding fat loss, weight management, and just an overall healthy lifestyle. Thanks so much. Have a great night.